Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to continue our, our study on Galatians and reading E.J. Wagner's um, response or review of the law in Galatians by G.I. Butler. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the blessings of fellowship. And we pray for the meeting tonight and the ones tomorrow. Uh, we know, Lord, that you have uh, purposes for us in our lives, and that you wish to teach us of Christ. We know, Lord, that there's much that we still do not understand, and so we ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher as we open your word together. We pray for one another, um, that we can encourage one another and point each other to Christ, and that we can minister to those around us. Thank you for the Sabbath and the blessings of it. And um, be with us now, as you have promised in your word. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So um, at the end of the study last week, we looked at Galatians chapter 3. We are reading through it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's questions about uh, the purposes of the law. I don't remember if we got through the whole thing. I'm just going to take a quick look here at um, the video. So it looks like we got, like in the video, we got to the end of it. We, we didn't discuss everything, but we're going to be going through this with uh, E.J. Wagner. He's going to be going through what, what, um, what, what we had studied in Galatians chapter 3. And I just kind of wanted to look ahead in in looking at it ourselves before we read what Wagner says. I'm not sure that I agree 100% with some of Wagner's arguments. Um, that is, I think there are a few little details that he's missing that, you know, we, we now can understand some things a little more clearly because as time has gone on, we've, we've seen this discussion. And you have to remember that, that Wagner's talking in a time. So, so think about this. I mean, what you have in that time is different than what you have today, right? So we have people who have moved from one ditch and driven into the other. So in some ways, the arguments that Wagner is going to use, his, his perspective, is addressing basically the type of legalism they had at that time. And we usually deal with a different type of legalism. They're both legalisms, whether there's people who believe that they, uh, you know, that they're arguing for, uh, you know, that we're under, you know, that we in some ways, um, how, how do I put that? Because um, because this species of legalism, they're, they're really the same in the sense that there is a type of self-righteousness, the dependence upon a person's own righteousness. But some people lift up the law as a standard of righteousness, uh, believing or professing that they're that they're living up to that standard and that they don't need any further instruction. And then you have other people who are legalists, uh, but have a lower standard. Right. So they they lower the standard of the law, so to speak, um, to something that they can reach. Now, in, in reality, neither of them can, can reach the standard, whether it's, it's this, whatever standard they profess as, as righteousness, because we aren't righteous. So even if we can meet some human standard, it's not going to be righteousness. And we probably won't even meet our own standard. That is, we might, uh, fail in that. Uh, because what, what needs to happen is, is a true conversion. And, and so this, these texts here address that, but, but they're addressing it from a different position than we usually are dealing with today, right? So that, that we need to keep in mind, but there still is, is a root of it that, that's the same. Because legalism is legalism. It's, um, depending upon one's own righteousness on some level, uh, to recommend us to Christ, that, that there, there is something in us that makes us righteous that doesn't come from Christ, 
right? So some people say, well, I do my best and God does the rest. Well, our best is what? Filthy rags? So we need perfect righteousness. So God has to, in a sense, do it all. It's all his righteousness. It's not any of ours. And yet it is real in the believer. That is, it's not a make-believe thing. It is Christ's righteousness. We we have no claim to it as being the originators of it. But we can be partakers of the righteousness, which is by faith in Christ. So, Theodore, yeah. um, I, read, I read a quote in, um, in Steps to, I mean, Christ's um, Object Lessons. I don't know if you read it or not, but it's in um, page... I think it's page 331. In which book? In Christ Object Lessons. Oh, Christ Object Lessons. Okay. Yeah. And it, and, um, yeah. This paragraph where it says, let no one say, I cannot remedy the defects of character if you come to that, to this, this, this decision you will certainly fail or of uh, obtaining eternal life. Yeah. yeah. How does it go along with what you just said? I mean, right. Well, and, and so we have to re- remedy our defects of character, but it's through Christ and in Christ, Christ. that it happens. It's real. But uh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I just wanted it because I, because I just read it today and I was just looking at it. And when you well, looked it up. well, unless Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in His people, He's not going to come to take them back, right? Because when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in His people, then shall He come to claim them as His own, right? Right. But that's Christ's character. Not man's character. Right. Christ's character has to be reproduced in us. Okay. So anyway, uh, getting back to to this. Um, now they're talking about the coming of the sea, right? So there was this discussion, so to speak, between Butler and Wagner, where um, the way that that uh, Butler's looking at this, this has to do with just the um, uh, trying to remember now. Uh, yeah. The, the first advent, right? So the first coming of Christ. So, <clears throat> and I will give some positive argument that coming referred to as the second advent. In doing this, I shall also proceed to consider verses 22 and 25. For they have an intimate connection with verse 19, verses 24 and 25. Read, thus, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, made righteous by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. By no manner of reasoning whatever can these verses be made to apply to the ceremonial law. The reference must be to the moral law and to that alone, as I shall show. Now, I agree with him. So the law that was our schoolmaster that was to bring us to Christ is the moral law, right? We can, we can all agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Now the ceremonial law has a function, but it, it's, it's a different function. It, it just typifies salvation and it, it's, it's uh, done to show the faith that a person already has, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't, create faith it's it's um ceremonial right okay um the text does not read that the law was our schoolmaster to point us to christ if it did there might be some show of reason in applying it to the ceremonial law but the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to christ or literally the law was our schoolmaster unto christ that is the law was our schoolmaster till we came to christ Now, the ceremonial law brought no one to Christ. The performance of it was an act of faith 
on the part of the performer showing the belief he already had in Christ, right? If it's done correctly. Faith did not release people from the observance of the ceremonial law. On the contrary, the person did not begin the observance of the ceremonial law until he had faith in Christ. The 22nd verse says that before faith came, we were kept under the law. But before faith came, people did not have anything to do with the ceremonial law. If the ceremonial law were referred to in this verse, then according to verse 25, we should conclude that as soon as people learned to have faith in Christ, they had nothing more to do with the ceremonial law. But the truth is, the patriarchs and prophets were most punctual in their observance of the ceremonial law, and no one had more faith than they. Take the case of David. His writings abound with references to sacrifices, to ceremonies in the court of the Lord's house. He offered multitudes of sacrifices, yet there's no writer in the Bible who shows a more perfect knowledge of Christ or who exhibits more faith in him. But you say the apostle is reasoning of dispensations and not of individual experiences. And that bringing them to Christ means bringing them to his first advent and to the system of faith there inaugurated. But that is the weakest position you could take, for if that were the meaning, then it would follow that the law accomplished its purpose only for the generation that lived at Christ's first advent. No other people ever came to Christ in the sense in which you use the term. In order for the law to bring men to Christ in the sense in which you apply it, that is, to his first advent, they would have to have had to lengthen their days or their lives. Adam would have had to live at least 4,000 years. But let me again repeat, the text does not say that the law was a schoolmaster to point men to Christ, but to bring them to him. Again, the text says it brings men to Christ, that they may be justified by faith. Are people justified by faith in a national capacity? I've just shown that according to the theory that the apostle is arguing of dispensations, only one generation was brought to Christ, namely the generation that had the good fortune to live at his first advent. But even that generation was not justified by faith. Very few of them had any faith whatever. They didn't have any faith from first to last. Then they must have remained under the schoolmaster, the law, and indeed they did. Justification by faith is an individual and not a national matter. Seventh-day Adventists often speak of the great light which we as a people possess, but we as a people will derive no benefit from that light unless we, as individuals, possess it in our own hearts. I repeat, justification by faith is something that each individual must experience for himself. Thousands who lived in at Christ's first advent knew nothing of this experience, while thousands who lived long before he came were actually brought to Christ for pardon, and they received it. Abel was counted righteous through faith. Noah was heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And Abraham actually saw Christ's day and rejoiced in it, although he died 2,000 years before the first advent. And this most positively proves that the apostle in the third chapter of Galatians is speaking of individual experience and not of dispensational changes. There can be no Christian experience, no faith, no justification, no righteousness that is not an individual matter. People are saved as individuals and not as nations or even churches. A word of explanation may be in place right here. The term under the law, if it be applied to the ceremonial law, cannot have the same meaning that it does when applied to the moral law. So, so this is an important point here, because one of the main things that they're discussing here is what it means to be under the law. Right? And so we know that um, uh, and one of the things I want to point out in, in Galatians chapter three is it talks about under the law. But he also talks about what the scripture hath complete, concluded all under sin. Right. So to be under the law means to be under its condemnation or under sin. And, and and this is really the main issue that was being discussed because we had one group of people just said, well, well, under the law just means not under, under that we're not under obligation to keep the ceremonial law. That's, that's the view of Butler. 
where Wagner and Jones argue that under the law means to be under its condemnation and that that law is the moral law. So when we're no longer under the law, but under grace, that would have a very different meaning if the law is the moral law than if it's the ceremonial law. So he's going to say here that um, we can't use the term under the law when we apply it to the ceremonial law. It cannot have the same meaning that it does when applied to the moral law. When used with reference to the moral law, it means condemned by the law. But it cannot, but it cannot have that meaning that it does when applied to the moral law. Okay, I, I skipped the line there. But it cannot have that meaning if it should be applied to the ceremonial law. So it can't mean condemned by the law. Because that law condemned nobody. So with the supposition that the expression refers to the ceremonial law, we must conclude that not to be under it means not to be subject to it. But when we refer to the moral law, we come to no such conclusion. Because under the law means condemned by the law. So you have to think quite clearly here because we th throw this term around under the law and sometimes people think it just means under obligation to keep it. And if you think that's what it means, then you would say, well, we're not under the ceremonial law. But if you apply it to the moral law, then that means something very different. Not under the moral law doesn't mean we're not under obligation to keep it, but that we're under its condemnation. And this is really the heart of the difference when it comes to how Butler and Wagner saw the phrase under the law. <clears throat> the strongest argument against the ceremonial law view is found in verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, it is an undeniable fact that the possession of faith led to the offering of sacrifices and not the offering of sacrifices to faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, I ask, how could the ceremonial law lead a man to that which he already had, since it was faith that prompted Abel and all others to offer sacrifices. How can it be said that those sacrifice, sacrifices served as a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ, that they might be justified by faith? I've already noticed your idea that the word faith is here synonymous with Christ, that the apostle means that before Christ came, they were kept under the law, that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto the first advent of Christ, that we might be justified by him. And that verse 25 means that after Christ has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So that's Butler's view. I believe that this is the position that is usually taken by those who hold the ceremonial law view. And it is the only position that can be taken if the ceremonial law is referred to. The only thing that it lacks is proof. There's no warrant whatever for making the term faith synonymous with Christ. Besides, if that were true, then the text would teach that no man was justified until Christ's first coming, which is preposterous and unscriptural. For these reasons, for these, re for these reasons, we must conclude that the ceremonial law is not under consideration in this verse. It is evident that verse 19 and 24 are closely related. That is, in verse 19, in Galatians 3, wherefore serveth the, serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. And, and the other verse, uh, verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So we can see how these uh, two verses really ex help explain each other. <clears throat> Um, so he says that is when the law entered or was added, it was in the capacity of a pedagogue to bring men to Christ. Now, to abolish the law before it has brought to Christ all who can be induced to come to him would certainly be an act of injustice. 
the law must retain its office of pedagogue or taskmaster until all have come to Christ who will. And this will not be until probation closes and the Lord comes. Um, in its office as pedagogue, it is not against uh, the promise, but works in harmony with it. Thus, God made the promise to Abraham that he and his seed should inherit the earth. This promise was made to Abraham, not because of his inherent righteousness, but because of his faith, which was accounted to him for righteousness. The promise was confirmed in Christ. That is, none but those who exercised faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sins depends upon um, repentance of sin. And repentance of sin presupposes a knowledge of sin. And a knowledge of sin can be obtained only by the law. Therefore, the law acts as a pedagogue, overseer, or taskmaster to overwhelm men with a sense of their sin, that they may flee to Christ to be justified by faith. And this office, it must perform until all those who can be influenced to come to Christ have come. And the promise is fulfilled. Then the law will no longer have the capacity of a taskmaster. God's people will all be righteous walking in the law and the law will be in their hearts. They will not then need the law written in books or on tables of stone. That is the added law because they will have direct access to the throne of God and will all be taught of God. Thus the law was added or spoken to be a pedagogue to bring men to Christ. But when all who are worth saving have been brought to Christ, it will cease to have that capacity. This no more implies the abolition of law when the Lord comes than the fact that the law entered at Sinai implies that there was no law before. There was just as much law before it was spoken upon Mount Sinai and written out for the benefit of mankind as there is today. And when the law shall cease to be a pedagogue because it is brought to Christ, all who can be induced to come and all earthly copies of the law shall have been destroyed with the earth, the law will still exist. The foundation of the throne of God, unchanged to all eternity, as it has from all eternity. Right? So the writing of the law on two tables of stone doesn't create the law. That's not when the law is begins, right? It existed from eternity to eternity. And um, and so he makes a really good point here that when he says we are no longer under the law, he's talking about an individual, Paul is, about an individual experience. It's not like Christ came, you know, in the first century and did away with the ceremonial law. That's not what the verse is talking about. Now, in a sense that, you know, Christ did um, fulfill the law, right? He fulfilled the types, but that's not the law being spoken of here, right? So, so a person comes to Christ as an individual. Once he comes to Christ, he's no longer under the condemnation of the law because he's justified by faith. In spite of the fact that, you know, he has been a sinner, he can be justified. He can no longer be under, he will no longer be under its condemnation. That is the whole point. Of, of the position of Jones and Wagner when it comes to this issue of the law in Galatians. And it, it's quite a simple idea, really. And, and we can rejoice in the idea that we're not under its condemnation if we're in Christ Jesus. So Wagner goes on, he says, perhaps the following from the pen of Elder J. N. Andrews may be considered worthy of perusal. It is from his reply to H. E. Carver in the Review and Herald of September 16th, 1851. The idea that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith, is often urged as proof that the law is abolished. How is the law our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? We answer, it shows our guilt and just condemnation, and that we are lost without a savior. Here the apostle, who was converted since the time when it was said the law was abolished, had not known sin, but by the law, Romans 8, 7. By the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Read a full account of Paul's experience in this school. 
also his deliverance from the carnal mind, which is not subject uh, to the law of God. Romans 7, verse 7 to 25 and 8, verse 1 to 7. The instruction of the law is absolutely necessary. For without it, we can never know our guilt in the sight of God. It shows our just condemnation. Its penalty hangs over our heads. We find ourselves lost and fly to Jesus Christ. What does he do to save us from the curse of the law? Does he abolish the law that we that he may save its transgressor? He assures us that he did not come to destroy it. And we know that the law being holy, just and good cannot be taken back without destroying the government of him who gave it. Does the Savior modify his character and lessen its demands? Its character and lessen its demands, though, the law. Far from it, he testifies that one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 18, Luke 16, 17, and James 2, verse 20. And he shows that those who in heart commit any act of iniquity are transgressors of the law. Matthew 5, 22, 27, 28. And first John 315. If the Savior did not abolish or relax the law, how can those who have fled to him for refuge hope for salvation? What does he do to save the transgressors from the sentence of the law? He gives up himself to die in their stead. He lays down his own life a ransom for many. Matthew 20 verse 28. He gives them up, up himself to die in their stead. I read that as a question. Anyway, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Man, though justly condemned, uh, can now be pardoned without dishonoring God or making void his law. God, God can be just, and yet the justifier which believeth of him which believeth in Jesus. We could say God can be righteous, right? He can be just, righteous, and yet he can make righteous those that believe in Jesus, Romans 3.25 and 26. Had the law been abolished at the death of Christ, it could not have been a schoolmaster many years afterward to bring the Galatians to Christ. Paul testifies that he, that he had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But an abolished law could never have convinced him of sin as a transgressor. James 2, verse 8, 9, Romans 4, 15. We cannot know sin but by the law. But if the law was abolished by the death of Christ, the world has never known its sinful state or realized its need of a savior. We may state on the highest authority that the law brings us to faith, the justification, and that faith does not make void the law, but it establishes it. Galatians 3.23 3 and Romans 3.31. The fact that the law is our schoolmaster to show us the claims of God and our own just condemnation is direct evidence that it has not been abolished. Hence, though we have been, have been pardoned through the death of Jesus and thus rescued from its righteous sentence, we can never violate its precepts without being convinced by it as transgressors. So, I mean, this is pretty amazing if you think about um, Jan Anders. I, I can't remember when he died, but uh, I know it was early on. <clears throat> um, but here is basically making exactly the same argument as E.J. Wagner. And yet Butler argues that this is some kind of new view, um, you know, brought in from the Protestants. That's sort of how Butler looked at it. But this is um, Jane Anders, right? I mean, really probably one of the greatest scholars the Adventist Church produced. And um, <clears throat> it's basically the whole argument. He could have just probably quoted this and, and that would have been it. Um, now, there are some things to note here. I was going back where he was talking about this. So, so the idea... Um, how he takes this, this idea of the schoolmaster. So if we are to be, if we are to say that under the law means for it to be abolished, what would be the point of abolishing the ceremonial law? 
Because the ceremonial law does not condemn us, right? Yes, it won't be much of a point. No. So, so how would how would uh, getting rid of the ceremonial law, which God gave as types and symbols prophetically, how would the doing away of that law show that we're justified by faith? It would actually be our, an argument that when God gave the ceremonial law, that He actually made a mistake. That it, it its purpose. Um, was, well, well, it would just be simply the types and ceremonies to point to Christ, but it would have nothing. It doesn't condemn us. I mean, it points us to salvation, right? It points us to Christ. It shows that Christ is the one who comes and saves us. The offerings, the ceremonies, these things point to a savior. Um, but when it comes to the moral law, and I don't know how Jeff does that when he writes on the. Sorry. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> there must be some setup I have to set up in my. Uh, it's it's okay. I'm not trying um, to railroad you. <laughs> yeah. So so we can see that to be under the condemnation of the law, this is the gospel. The idea that we're no longer under the law uh, definitely can't refer to its abolishment. It must refer to not being under its condemnation in Christ, or else none of what is said in, in Galatians and Romans would make any sense. So E.J. Wagner goes on. He says in your pamphlet on page 50, you make considerable of the words the faith or that faith as though the word faith were used in a different sense than a personal faith in Christ. But I repeat again, there can be no faith except faith in Christ and faith in Christ is a personal matter. Each one must have faith for himself. Therefore, the coming of faith is to each individual as an individual and not to any people as a class. For the same reason also, I cannot accept your statement that the faith refers to the whole system of truth devised by God for the salvation of men and that its coming refers to the revelation of Christ that is first advent. If that were true, it would prove that the system of truth devised by God for the salvation of men was not known till Christ came, which is so evidently unscriptural as to need no comment. The theory which you hold, when traced to its conclusion, inevitably makes God have two plans of salvation, one for the people before the coming of the Lord and another for those after. It makes the Jews judged by one standard and the Gentiles by another. But the position which I have briefly outlined is consistent with itself and is consistent with the plainly revealed truth of Scripture concerning the plan of salvation. So there isn't two different ways of salvation. This is dispensationalism, right? The idea that the Jews, they, they have the sacrifices to save them and the Christians just have grace. <clears throat> He says, you say on page 51, we should be much pleased to have our friends who hold that this added law was the Ten Commandments. When he says friends, he's talking about our enemies, um, people who disagree with us. Um, so the friends who hold this added law was the Ten Commandments. Tell us how the law against blasphemy, murder, lying, stealing, etc. Shut individuals up, guard them in ward in relation to a child of a guardian to a revelation to be made afterwards. I'm not quite as sure I understand exactly what he's saying. It definitely did. I mean, it doesn't really make sense. The question doesn't make any sense. Uh, this I can readily do, uh, Wagner says. First, sinners are in the Bible, represented as being in bondage, in prison. See Second Peter 2.19, Romans 7.14, 1 Peter 3.19 and 20, Zechariah 9, verse 12, Psalm 68, verse 6. 102 verse 19 and 20, Acts 8, 23, Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15. Note the last text particularly. Christ died to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It is sin that brings the fear of death. Therefore, it is sin that causes men to be subject to bondage. Second, whenever men are in prison, it is the law that puts them there. Only a few weeks ago, I heard a judge pronounce the death sentence that he was compelled 
that he was compelled to pronounce the sentence, that he was simply, um, that he was simply the law's agent, that since the man had been found guilty, the law demanded his death and that he was simply the mouthpiece of the law. It is the law which arrests the criminal. The sheriff is simply the visible agent of the law. It is the law which locks the prisoner in his cell, the jailer, uh, the iron walls and heavy bars which surround the prisoner are simply the emblems of the iron hand of the law which is upon him. If the government is just and if the man is indeed guilty, there's no way in which he can escape the punishment unless he has a powerful advocate who can secure pardon from the governor. Um, so it is with the sinner against God's government. The eyes of the Lord are in every place so that there is no possibility that he can escape arrest. As soon as he has sinned, he is seized by the law and is at once under condemnation of death because it has already been declared that the wages of sin is death. Now he is shut in on every side by the law. There's not one of the commandments which is not against him because there is not a man on earth who has not broken every one of them. At first, the sinner may not be conscious of his imprisonment. He has no sense of sin and does not try to escape. But when the law is so applied to him that he can realize its claims and his failure to meet him, meet them, he is convicted to carry out the figure. We might say that the spirit of God causes the prison walls to close in upon him. His cell becomes narrow and his feels and he feels oppressed. And then he makes desperate struggles to escape. He starts out in one way, but there is the first commandment arises against him and will not let him go free. He turns in another, but uh, he has taken the name of God in vain. And the third commandment refuses to let him get his liberty in that direction. Again, and he tries, but he has committed adultery. And the seventh commandment presents an impenetrable barrier in that direction. Again, he tries, but he has... Um, uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay, I got and, and prevents his escape. I skipped a line. So with all the commandments, they utterly refuse to grant him liberty because he has violated every one of them. And only those who keep the commandments can walk at liberty. Psalm 119, verse 45. He is completely shut in on every side. There is, however, just one avenue of escape. And that is through Christ. Christ is the door, John 10, verse 9. An entrance through that door gives freedom, John 8, 36. Since the sinner is in prison and cannot get freedom except through faith in Christ, it is exactly the truth to say that he is shut up to the faith which must be revealed to him. The translation kept in ward affects the case for you, not in the least. It is the same as saying that we are kept in prison. Pharaoh's butler and the baker were put in ward. In the same prison where Joseph was, Genesis 40, verse 3. Now, it is not the Jews alone who are spoken of as shut up. You yourself say that the Jews were as were in as bad case as the Gentiles would. The 22nd verse of the third of Galatians says also says that the scripture hath concluded literally shut up together all under sin. This shows in what the shutting up consists. They are in jail because they have sinned. So Paul says to the Jews, what then? Are we better than they? No, no, no in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, Romans 3, 9. And again, he says that God hath concluded them all, margin, shut them all up together in unbelief, Romans eleven thirty two. These statements are identical with that in Galatians. Now, notice that in all places, the shutting up is said to be for the same purpose. Galatians 3.22 says that the scripture hath concluded or shut up all under sin. That the promise of faith by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. In the third of Romans, Paul shows that Jews and Gentiles are alike under sin. In order to prove that the righteousness of God which is by faith in Christ, Christ or Jesus Christ, may be unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verses 22 to 24. And in Romans 11, 32, he states that God hath shut them up all together, both Jews and Gentiles, in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. All, all are in the same bondage. All are under the law. And none can be delivered from their prison until they come to Christ. He is the only door to freedom. Okay, so hopefully this is really clear. Um, I mean, it's clear to me. So if people do have questions or want to add anything, you can. So, I mean, one thing we can see here is obviously uh, the ceremonial law can't possibly be uh, the law. It has to be the moral law that shuts up men under sin. Let me ask if you think that it is the ceremonial law that shuts men up under sin. If you do, then you hold that the ceremonial law is a rule of righteousness, and thereby you detract from the Ten Commandments. But it, but if you do not, if you do not hold this opinion, and I cannot believe that you do, then you admit that it is the moral law that shuts men up and asks acts as their taskmaster to drive them to Christ, that they may be justified by faith. How anybody can hold a different view, I cannot imagine. Again, you say, we claim that this expression under the law has two significations, primarily meaning under the authority of the law or under obligation to keep it, right? Or the second one, under the condemnation of the law with its penalty impending over us. We're already suffering it. The expression does not decide which of these meanings is to be understood. The connection must decide that. So this is Butler saying there's two different meanings, significations. Either it means under obligation to keep the law or it means under the condemnation of the law. And that we need to understand the context when we're going to apply which of these meanings. Um, now, Wagner, Wagner goes on. He says it would have been more to the point if you had quoted some instances outside of the one under the one under discussion to show that under the law is ever used in the sense of subject to the law. Uh, to be sure, you quote from Greenfield's lexicon where it is stated that the word hupo is used with the sense of subjection to the law. But you should remember that it is in the province of lexicon simply to give the meaning of a word and not to decide upon points of doctrine. When Greenfield says that hupo means under, he states a simple truth. But when he says that it is used in the sense of subjection to the law, he gives merely his opinion upon a text of scripture. And his opinion on the meaning of a text of scripture is no better than that of any other man. Indeed, I think that if you had examined Greenfield a little more closely, you would have left his opinion in this matter out entirely. He cites Romans 6.14 as an instance of the use of the word kupo in the sense of subjection to the law. And that is the only text that he does give as an illustration. There's no more doubt in your mind than there is in mind that the text refers to the moral law and to that alone. So if you accept Greenfield as a commentator, you will read the text thus, for ye are not subject to the law, but under grace. And this would suit the enemies of truth. But I know that you do not accept it. Your argument from Greenfield is certainly an unfortunate one. For you say, uh, uh, for you, uh, a fortunate one for you. You say, Greenfield gives a variety of definitions, comments, you should have said, such as the sense in many place, places requires, one of which is of subjection to the law, etc., he gives no interest in instance where it is used in the sense of being subject to the condemnation of the law. That is, he gives no instance where he thinks it is used in the sense of subject to the law as one where it does unquestionably mean condemned by the law. I have not time here to give an exposition of every text where the expression under the law occurs. I've done this in my articles. And you have not noticed or attempted to overthrow a single position which I took upon those texts. I therefore repeat that the exceptions of Romans 3.19 and 1 Corinthians 9.21, where the word hubo is not found, and which should probably be translated in the law, the term under the law 
wherever it occurs in the New Testament, means condemned by the law. It never has any other meaning. Christians are all subject to the moral law, but they are not under it. If they were under it, they would not be Christians. You say, the moral law never led a man to Christ and left him. It always stays with him. We may be delivered from its condemnation, but its supreme authority must be regarded then as before. Its claims never leave us. This is Butler's view. <clears throat> and, 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 and Wagner says, I agree with that most heartily. The law does not leave the man when it, he comes to Christ. But the man's relation to it is changed. Before, he was under the law. Now he is in the law. And the law is in him. He is in Christ, who is the personification of the law. And in him, he is made the righteousness of God. Again, you say of the moral law, there's nothing in that law about Christ, not a hint. All that law does is to condemn those who break it and justify those who keep it. It is the sense of guilt in the man's conscience, which is acted upon by the spirit of God, which makes him go to Christ, not anything in the moral law itself. Hmm. Can anybody see that that makes any sense, what Butler says there? Okay. So. It says, he, it says that he was under the law. Let's see. Yeah, I'm trying to understand but, what Butler's thinking here. I mean, the idea that there's nothing in the law about Christ, not a hint. Yeah. All the law does is to condemn those who break it. How could the law condemn somebody if Christ is not in it? The reason why the law condemns a man is because it reveals Christ's character. Anyway, uh, I got to see what Wagner's going to say. I don't remember what he says about this. This admits my whole argument. Pray tell me what makes the sense of guilt in the man's conscience. Paul says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Have you found something else besides the law of God? which will make a man conscious of a sinful condition. If conscience has the power in itself to make a man conscious of his guilt, what office, pray tell me, has the law? What is the use of the law if the conscience alone convicts of sin? And if the conscience possesses the quality of making a man conscious of his guilt, why is it that all men are not equally conscious of guilt? The reason, and the only reason that can be given, is that some men are better instructed in the law than others. You cannot escape the conclusion that it is the law which produces a sense of guilt in the man's conscience by which he is driven to Christ. Unless you deny that by the law is the knowledge of sin, since it is the sense of guilt in the man's conscience that makes him go to Christ and nothing but the law can produce a sense of guilt, it is emphatically the law which drives men to Christ. That is the office of the law to sinful men, to overwhelm them with the sense of guilt, and so to drive them to Christ that they may be justified by faith. True, the Ten Commandments say nothing about Christ, but does the sense of guilt in the man's conscience say anything about Christ? That is, does every man have a naturally a knowledge of Christ? Of course not. But the law begets in the man a consciousness of guilt. The law does not does this only by the aid of the spirit, of course, for the word of God is the spirit sword. But when the law through the spirit has produced this sense of guilt, the man feels oppressed and seeks for ease from his load and is forced to go to Christ because there's nowhere else that he can go. In trying to avoid my conclusion, you have the above quotation deliberately walked you have in the above quotation deliberately walked into it there was nothing else that you could do you continue by this added law but this added law did lead to christ so this is butler again right uh, every type every sacrifice every feast day holy day new moon and annual sabbath and all the priestly offerings and services pointed out something in the work of christ they were as a body shut up guarded under the control of this severe imperious pedagogue till the great system of justification by faith was reached at the cross of Christ 
Mr. Greenfield could readily see that this pedagogue must be used as an illustration of the Mosaic law. It is strange that all others cannot see the same. Okay, here you, you yourself admit the charge which I have brought against your theory, namely that it virtually makes two plans of salvation. If the great system of justification by faith was not reached till the cross of Christ, pray tell me whether anybody has ever justif- was ever justified before Christ came, and if so, how? My reading of the Bible convinces me that the great system of justification by faith was known as soon as sin entered into the world. I read that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. We have all these verses there. Scores of similar texts. I find the clearest reference in the great system of justification by faith. Some say, that we have a better knowledge of the plan of salvation than the ancients had. Indeed, in one meeting of the theological community, both you and Elder Canwright claimed that the patriarchs had very limited, if any, knowledge of Christ's real work. And you sustained Elder Canwright in his assertion that Christ introduced the gospel of his first advent. I do not think that you would have taken such a stand, only that your theory drove you to it. But Christ and Paul based on their instruction concerning that great system upon the Old Testament. And I've never seen a man with so much knowledge of God that he could not study with profit the words of David and Isaiah concerning justification by faith. In Great Controversy, Volume 1, in the paragraph beginning at the bottom of page 58, I read that angels held communication with Adam after his fall and informed him of the plan of salvation. Certainly, if Adam was ignorant of the great system of justification by faith, it was not because of the incompetency of his teachers. After the battles which we have had to wage with Campbellites concerning the value of the Old Testament scriptures and the unity and universality of God's plan of salvation, it seems almost incredible that anyone should be called on to defend against Seventh-day Adventists the idea that the well-informed Jew had a full knowledge of Christ and was justified only through faith. The quotation from your pamphlet, which I made last, closes thus. <clears throat> so Butler says, Mr. Greenfield could readily see that this pedagogue must be used as an illustration of a mosaic law. It is strange that all others cannot see the same. I might with equal propriety say, Mr. Greenfield could readily see that Galatians ought to keep the first day of the week. It is strange that others cannot see the same. Or again, I might say, Mr. Greenfield could readily see that the expression under the law in Romans 6.14 means subject to the law. It is strange that others cannot see the same. The only strange thing I can see about it is that you should use such an argument as that. I care nothing for what a man says. I want to know what God says. We do not teach for doctrine the word of men, but the word of God. And I'm verily convinced that you would not quote Greenfield if you could find the scripture argument instead. Again, on page 54, I read, all all God now requires is a humble heart, repentance and confession of sin, faith in the precious blood of Christ, and a determination to serve God and obey all his requirements. This you say of the time after Christ, and it still further emphasizes the charge, which I bring against your theory, that it makes two plans of salvation. Can you tell me what else or more than that God required of the Jews? Were they accepted in any other way than by humility of heart, repentance, confession of sins, faith in the blood of Christ, and a determination to obey God? Nay, verily. I will now pass brief notice of your comments on chapter four, the first of your arguments on the elements of the world. I'm not going to go into this one. So... We're going to come to this one next time. So I'm going to finish. Well, we're going to finish this up, but I don't want to go into this elements of the world yet. uh, Because that is quite a topic. So um, any any questions about what we have read and what Wagner has said to Butler? So so I said to go back to you. What? Kelly? Uh, I'd like to go back back to the first uh, or yeah. Hmm. 
discussion of Christ Object Lessons 69 and the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced. Now, I like that idea right off the get-go. The first time I heard it, when I was an Adventist, I'm like, yes. But it was inter- it's been interesting to me to, to hear the conversations around it, the discussions and the resistance to the idea. And then I wonder, well, why the resistance? And, and I look at my own experience and I understand why, because reality and the rubber aren't meeting the road here about the character of Christ being reproduced in us perfectly. So then creeps yeah. in doubt. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that I was going to comment on earlier. Not not... Hold, on. Hold, on. Hold, on. Hold, on. Hold on. I got more. It gets better. Yeah. And uh, so I was wondering about why in the doubt. Doubt creeps in. And we doubt. We doubt mainly because we see ourselves mm-hmm. and the lives of others that are failing, failing around us. Mm-hmm. And so the doubt, the question of doubt, and I, I wrestled with that a little bit, and then I had the thought that Christ removed all doubt at the cross of anything that God said or will to, says. says. Mm-hmm. Now, God said that this is true. That why can't we entertain the idea in the realm of possibilities in our own life or even as a concept that it could be true, that that will happen? And, uh, okay, so... Removing the doubt, why <clears throat> he removed the, you know, all doubt at the cross. And that answered the question <clears throat> for me as well. I, I wondered, because I've heard it, doubt is sin. And so why is doubt sin? Because Christ removed all doubt at the cross. To doubt that would be a sin, I guess. How does that work? <laughs> well, well, I think, you know, one of the things... When, when it comes to what Christ accomplished at the cross. So when we think about this and in connection with faith. So Christ, Christ demonstrated, he demonstrated righteousness in his life and in his death. And he, he is the example of righteousness by faith. So, um, and when we look at this issue dealing with condemnation, right? So what you have with people like uh, Butler, what you have with with um, our human nature, because Butler is really speaking of human nature and how he's approaching this. He he doesn't really believe that he's condemned by the law. Does that make sense? Sorry, I, I, I had that on mute there. I, I chuckled at first when I read that or heard you say that, but yeah, I didn't know that about Butler. Yeah. So because when he says, were they accepted in any other way than by what well, he goes back, where is it here that he says, all God now requires is a humble heart, repentance and confession of sin, faith in the precious blood of Jesus and a determination to serve God and obey all his requirements. So now this is true that that's what God has always required, but People often believe that they have all of those things. They don't really believe that they're under the condemnation of the law. That is, they believe that somehow they have reached a level of righteousness. That, that they're, really? They're, yes, they do. People believe this. That's, that's, I just struggle with that idea. I'm sorry, but wow. Well, at least they try to fool themselves in in some way. It's like the the Pharisee. Meet these people on Pharisee's Corner or downtown somewhere. Like you just you just go to any Seventh Day Adventist church. Really? Yeah. Like really? Mm -hmm. No. What do they say? It's not what they say, because people would never say this. They would never say that they're righteous. Right, because they know you can't say that. But they definitely act as if they are better than other people. What does that look like? Well, gossip. What, what is what is a gossip doing? Well, it's tearing down. It's devouring each other. Yeah. Judging yeah. other people. Yeah. Right. There's judgment element. Right. So all of these things show that when we think that we're better than somebody, that we hold some opinion 
that's greater than someone else's opinion. Uh, we show ourselves. Hold on, to be I want to move on. Hold, hold, hold on, I just, I'm, I'm just want to dissect that a little bit more about the gossip. Like, there is a fine line between what gossip and talking about somebody somehow. Well, yeah, I mean, I talk about people all the time, but not in a way that I'm delighting in hearing bad things about them, or I'm or I'm repeating bad things. That's about them. that's that, that's my, one of my one of my favorite words uh, to know. Schadenfreude, like that's talking, that's taking delight in the fall or demise of your enemies, yeah, or their misfortunes. Yeah, Schadenfreude, mm-hmm. but no, not that. I guess maybe. Is there that kind of a? Well, there's that, but but just gossip. gossip when you know somebody has done some terrible thing, and and we want yeah. to tell other people about it because yeah. you know that that shows you know especially if that's yeah, a person hear about that I have a conflict with, right? Like, like, hey, did you hear about? Did you hear about? Question mark. Right. Blank. Leave it open. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so, um, but there's there's another point that I wanted to bring up, just dealing with the idea of of condemnation. So, the one thing that I, the, one of the reasons I became a Seventh Day Adventist is within the other churches, people were just interested in, in uh, being saved, right? Mm-hmm. They weren't interested in overcoming. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? A popular series of books and concept in the eighties, especially. Oh, yeah. Well, the idea is that they just believed, you know, once you've made a confession of of Christ, you're saved. And why are you so concerned about trying to overcome sin? You're, we all sin. Just accept that, Christ's that right among Adventists, because I really identify that among the evangelicals. Mainstream. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking about the other churches. Oh, so that's sorry. why I Thank you. add to this because in the other churches, I didn't find that anybody was interested in overcoming sin. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> and I wanted to overcome sin. I wasn't concerned about being saved because I believe that God loved me and that he wanted to save me. So I, I didn't really know what you were doing. What's that? Hopefully, you, uh, part of the equation is we hate what we're doing. That was that's what right. another thing what I was doing. Want to overcome sin. Yeah, I hated my actions. So, so I was looking for a gospel that could deliver me from my sin, not just deliver mm. me from, you know, being condemned. You know, so so many people they yeah. just say, you know, well we're not condemned, well, or Jesus died for us, and so you can continue sinning, sort of thing. You know, just go uh, to him. Somehow, somehow, and the and the fear of fear of uh, fear of condemnation or fear of hell doesn't really enter into the the part the ingredients of repentance, does it? Well, it's not I don't the know. fear of hell. It's not the fear of hell that saves us, but well, I I never had the fear of hell, but um, I, you know, I'm not I can't really say anything about it because I've never experienced it. I had the fear of sinning. Okay. One. That I didn't want to continue doing what I was doing. Not because of the consequences but eternally, but because yeah. of the consequences to those around me. Okay. Right? Because that's, that's the thing that, uh, uh, in my own experience as well, like, even as a child, like a six year old boy having a fight with my neighbor, best friend in the world, and uh, Giberto, Gibi, and I beat him up. And then I go back to my place on back step next door and I'm crying my eyes out because I hurt my best friend in the world. And I just hated hurting people, even as a kid, you know. Mm-hmm. And it carried with me through the adulthood, thankfully. Don't like it much. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes you hurt yourself a bit, but that's another whole well, issue. Well, there we go. You gotta keep things yeah. balanced, you know. Yeah. But, but the point is that the, the gospel that I see in Adventism, where, uh, you know, you know, Christ comes back when his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. Well, that to me was, you know, a revelation. That was, that was a wonderful thing to read, you know, Christ's object lessons, desire of ages, 
uh, these books that described the Christ I knew through the people that were Christ-like that I knew, mm-hmm. right? But I didn't find that in the churches, right? So in, in the Christian churches, I, I found it in the book of Christ. Oh, yeah. The rest of the churches. Yeah. Well, even even within Adventism, I didn't necessarily find it in the people. It was it was in the spirit of prophecy and the teachings of Adventism. I found that. What well, made it wonderful? What's that? What made it wonderful? To uh, what made it wonderful? What is wonderful about that? I mean, I I had some other thoughts about it, but I lost them now. But well, the the wonderful idea about the concept. It was great to see. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. It was a relief for you. It was like an answer yeah. to the, something you've been looking for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something that I've been looking for. And, and, you know, part of it, I think, and I've talked about this before, but it was Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories where I first saw mm. the real Christ. Um, and I noticed that that Jesus was way different than the Jesuses in the other churches and definitely different than the Jesus in the United Church. Of Canada, United Church of Canada. Mm-hmm. As a very like Jesus in the United Church. <laughs> yeah, they, it's a different Jesus, right? I know, I know, I know. It, it's it's not that personal Jesus that I that I knew. One I wouldn't recognize. Yeah. So so there was yeah. a Jesus I knew as a child, and Uncle Arthur's bedtime story books had that Jesus. I didn't know they were Adventists until after I read Desire of Ages. And then I realized, oh, that that's why those books had this Jesus in it. But it's, it's very different. And, and, and it's hard for Adventists to understand because they just assume other Christians think of Jesus the same way they do. But they don't. Yeah, that's true. It's like it's almost like being in a different country. And not knowing the yeah. customs or way, ways people talk about stuff. Yeah, that's that's why this whole idea about well, do is does, does Islam worship the same God as we do? Well, obviously not. Not even uh, etymologically, because uh, there's no relationship to 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 uh, uh, the God of Islam and the God of the Jews. But um, but definitely, uh, you know, if other Christians don't even worship the same God that we do. Well, how could, how could Islam be? So, True. so those, those are the one thoughts. Of ways, mm, one of my favorite ways on that uh, to get past that, worshipping different gods, is, well, tell me about the god that you worship. Tell me about him. And then I, you know, this is an old one. But yeah, okay, I can agree with that. I don't like that god either. Can I tell you about the god that I think? Oh, and boy, people are amazed the answers that are in the Bible to some some of the most difficult questions that they've not heard before. But as Adventists, I find we have these answers more so than more so. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. getting less and less. But I mean, if anybody reads mm-hmm. the Spirit of Prophecy, you're coming you into contact with Christ um, in a way that that has been hindered with the Bible. That is, the Bible has had this um, image placed around it that sort of a, this barrier. It's like it's like the veil over the eyes of the Jews when it came to uh, the Old Testament. And we see the same thing with Christians with the New Testament. They see it with a veil over their eyes. And, and part of that is just an understanding of the nature of Christ, which we're going to get into. And that, that is one of the, the real keys, understanding that Christ had the same nature and how close he comes to us. Because for most Christians, Jesus is very far off. Mm. And that's why a lot of them focus upon the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's more an imaginary thing. Yeah. A feeling. Yeah, it's more a feeling. Yeah. It's more a more feeling. It's more it's more um I, it's more spiritualism. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they don't they don't get the same um because when you come to Christ you you see your sinfulness, but the Holy Spirit you, stuff you, actually puffs up. Me. Have, you, have you been much around uh, Pentecostal services or someone laying hands on you in glossolalia? Yeah. Have you been around yeah. that at all? Oh yeah, yeah and I ran the first time. First time guy did that at, at a it was a uh, 
what was it? Uh, it just surprised me. It was at a, a evangelistic series. And he put his hand on my shoulder as we we're praying, everybody in the crowd. And mm-hmm. then he started speaking in tongues. And I popped my head up. I looked at him and I went, what? <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to tell you all my experiences, but part of it, you know, was what we had uh, with the people's oh, church. Yeah. And- Right. Oh, yeah, so we, the people's church. Yeah, where they would have like a two hour praise service. They had to condemn go to them because they were worried that the balcony was going to collapse. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My, my dad would take for, for too many people. Yeah. My dad would take me and my brother Peter to these meetings. And, and we would just sit there looking around at all these crazy yeah. people for two hours. It, it was insane. <laughs> But anyway, we got to go. Went there for a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here. Thank you for the Sabbath. And we ask for your care and protection for each one. Uh, we ask for your angels to watch over our loved ones. And uh, for this Sabbath to be a blessing to all. Continue to be with us and be with us in the meetings tomorrow. And uh, bless those that watch these videos and, and all that we come in contact with. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.